but the, so it does say live because it's where we've questioned is it or isn't it so this, oh, I'm supposed to go live in here you are Okay, well, we are going to hang out here for a few minutes still as we uh, wait until it becomes the noon hour. So just hold tight with us, um, and you may see me disappear in and out as we do some final preparations. So like I said, we are waiting until the noontime hour. So those of you who are still logging on, feel free to come on. If you do have any questions or comments you'd like to share, you can go ahead and type those in under the live stream. So that way they can be ready for us when we get going first thing off.
So again, if you're just joining us, we are waiting until the noon o'clock hour in order for us to start. So feel free in the meantime to go ahead and type any questions or things like that you might have to discuss today into the chat area. And we'll be sure to make sure we answer those today. All right, according to my clock, it is now the noon hour. So welcome everybody today to this uh, month's, I guess, session of current problems in the yard and garden. As I've already mentioned, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to put them into the chat area and I will try to address them as time goes on. So do keep that in mind that you do have the ability to do that uh, in today's program. I would like to welcome everybody back uh, this month. I am here at Gabus, uh, Purdue Northwest Gabus Arboretum, and I am Nikki Witkowski, and I work with the Porter County Extension Office. So in my job, I work with basically answering questions and things like that uh, as time goes on. And I answer questions in relation to like bugs sometimes and plants and things like that. Um, I see their question is, are the... Oh, uh, are there muddy trails here at Tall Tree? Yeah, there might be some, but this weekend, since we're not going to get a lot of rain, uh, they uh, will hopefully dry out maybe a little bit until we get the next rain forecast. Otherwise, uh, we'll let that uh, be answered by another gar or gave us our read em employee. So today, where I'd like to start out with is, first of all, just kind of a denoting. You know, it's always great to get out and explore your gardens and see what is going on or not at this time of the year. I get sometimes interesting questions and problems that come into the office and sometimes it's things we don't always realize that are normal or happening or not. And so for example, today when I was walking in, I, I decided to pick on some of the plants here and I, I saw this tree and then I saw these crazy little structures coming off the tree and I was like, oh, what is that? It looks so interesting. Well, what some of you may or may not have already figured out is the fact that if we actually look at this tree's leaf, uh, 
those of us who know some tree ID techniques, what we notice about the veins on this leaf is that they're kind of going out in straight uh, angles away from the vein. That is a very typical of a beech tree. So this is off of a beech tree out here. And what this little spiny crazy thing is, is that this is actually the future seed pod. So it looks really hairy and scaly right now. And then some of this is going to fall off. And then eventually this will break open and show you a more triangular seed pod later on in the year. So that is something that you can actually be watching for uh, as time goes on is to see all these different seed pods and things like that that are starting to develop now for later. There's also some really interesting cones starting to develop on certain trees and uh, other plants as well if you were to go looking at them. Uh, I even had a laugh once that uh, I didn't even know or I never thought of it. Our dogwood trees would have shapes on them or structures on them and they come on more in the fall because they're obviously flowering right now. Uh, but later in the year, they'll develop a ball-like structure and not everybody recognizes, yeah, that's the seeds of the plant. Another fun fact, the white of a dogwood's flower is actually a bract, which is a modified leaf. It's not a true leaf on the plant at all. Uh, it's a modified leaf. Another kind of little fun fact that I will also point out to you is that if you kind of go out and looking at some of your trees and stuff like that in the landscape right now, I encourage you to try to find our state tree of Indiana. If you don't know what our state tree of Indiana is called, it is actually the tulip tree. You know, and that's kind of one of the slang terms for it of a tulip tree. Uh, but that is the style of tree it is. And what is very intriguing about a tulip tree is the fact that as its namesake kind of is in state, a tulip tree will actually develop a tulip-like flower. And guess what? This is the time of the year that you will see these structures. These structures are the size of what a normal tulip may be. If you do not see these on your tree, it just may not be mature enough at this time in order for you to have those developing on it. But it's really, really awesome to see those on it. You know, you saw that picture there where there's some oranges and yellows in them sometimes. Uh, different trees will vary on the color a little bit, but it just really is a very cool and interesting flower that's pretty sustainable, you know, if you want to see it. And again, like I said, mature trees, you know, can get covered in these flowers and just look so pretty. Uh, it was interesting that I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, oh yeah, yeah, it's an awesome tulip tree. And I said, all the tulips are blooming in it right now. And they're like, what are you talking about? And they'd lived there for, you know, three, four, five years. I don't know how long. And they had no clue. First of all, it was a tulip tree. And they, second of all, never realized what the flowers looked like in that tree before. Because those flowers amass a bunch of green leaves. Yeah, they're not going to look like a lot if you're not used to really paying attention and observing the leaves of the tree and observing trees and plants. Um, but once you learn to, you know, try to observe things with a little more fine coast, you know, fine tune uh, look on things, you start noticing things like that or like the structure I showed you earlier, again, of this seed pod that's really interesting in trees. So I guess that's my general note for the morning so far or afternoon. I guess it's just afternoon. So, you know, take time when you're out in the landscapes and the gardens as things are, you know, opening up, you know, both with plants and out, you know, with the businesses and stuff like that. Take time while you're outside to actually look at the plants and see what's going on. I was proud of a homeowner this week that they called me out and said, oh, yeah, uh, my spruce tree is having problems. And I expected to go out there and see a tree in major disrepair because that's usually when I get called out. But no, the tree actually had very little death on it. And the homeowner, and granted, for where it was happening, it was at almost eye level of the homeowner. But they actually caught on very early on, which will help the tree in the long run so that they can actually see what's going on and how we might be able to make things better in the long run sooner before more damage actually can occur on the tree. So again, I encourage you all, you know, while it's nice and sunny, get out there and enjoy the landscape. Now, again, some things that you may start seeing in the landscape, you know, I went out and started looking at some oak trees, and you start noticing these kind of almost a blistery-like structure on them. This is very common to be happening right now. You know, here are some different leaves and to varying degrees of what you see kind of going on on them. 
And those were some more major ones. Here's one with a little bit more minor of a spot. So these are basically what we might call like a blister gall or some sort of basically gall-like structure on a tree. And we might call it a gall-like just because it's an abnormal growth. And it is kind of bumped and raised. So if I turn the leaf, you know, it's hard to show, you know, virtual versus in person. Um, but this is like a raised portion right here, kind of like what we might think of a pimple. Now, granted, it's flat. So, you know, this, you know, goes in where this part comes out. So it's not actually like a ball. But again, we might call this a leaf blister. So this is specifically a leaf blister type of a gall that is growing on oak trees. And it is extremely common if you actually go looking at it right now in the landscape, you may find it easily. You know, I may butcher this name, but it's called a typharina uh, or basically oak leaf blister. So that is what it is called. And you can definitely look up other pictures and images of this oak blister gall. Now you may say, oh no, my tree is going to die. What am I going to do? No, there's a lot of things that can happen to our plants that are really minor. I say it's kind of like us getting a cold. It's a really minor disease in the long run. It's really not going to cause that much damage or that many problems for the tree overall. And that's exactly like how uh, this uh, fungal reaction is on the tree. So yes, it's going to create all these blistery spots on it. And then as you look later in the year, you know, these leaves are kind of fuzzy as it is right now. But as you look later in the year, you may actually see spore-like structures coming from the back side of these leaf galls. So you may see that, and they may brown out, and they may fall off sooner than other leaves. But we have to realize this fact that even on this leaf, we still have other areas of the leaf that are just fine. It's not causing a major leaf loss, so we really aren't going to be very concerned at all. This is not something that we're going to try to treat at all. It's just some, something that is going to be interesting on that leaf and make it look like it's got the measles or something crazy going on. But otherwise, it's no problem at all. You know, another similar disease um, that we may talk about is one of maple trees, and it's called anthracnose. So if you ever see on, like, how this picture shows, you know, this one shows it primarily in the leaf veins. It can be between the leaf veins, but if you have especially a maple and have that darkening of leaves, yeah, you've got some anthracnose going on. You know, it's something to be aware of. It's something to know about. But again, it's just like this tephrina, or tephrina, I'm sorry, tephrina of the oaks. It's not going to cause a problem. Now, anthracnose, unlike the oak leaf blister, the anthracnose is more likely to cause a leaf drop. Now, keep in mind, trees can drop their leaves for various reasons, you know, as the year goes on. So they can actually go through almost a complete drop of leaves and re-leaf out and be just fine. So the anthracnose, you know, I don't believe, at least up in this northern part of the state, where we've not had, you know, high amounts of rain. We're still verging drought conditions here. Um, but up in this area, you know, we really haven't had high amounts of rain. So we don't have a terrible amount of anthracnose this year. We just have a minor infection of anthracnose. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of it because, again, we have a minor infection due to minor amounts of rain because we're borderlining drought. So don't be concerned if you see leaves on your trees that look like that, especially if they're in the maple family, because, again, it may be no big deal. Um, I will point out, though, same name, similar, but not the same disease. If you hear, though, of anthracnose on a dogwood, that might have more cause for concern because there is a variety of anthracnose that gets on dogwoods that do cause a problem. Um, but again, for most trees, and it's you know primarily our maples and primarily our silver maples uh, that get this anthracnose. Again, not a huge deal, not a huge problem. And like I said, it's a little worse than this whole oak blister uh, that we see because again, these leaves may not even fall. They may hang on all year long, stay green all year long, not have a problem at all and you know to be just fine as the season goes on so just be aware again we do have minor diseases and problems that can pop up and cause problems you know as the, as time goes on and we really shouldn't be too worried or concerned about them in the long run uh, it's just something that can happen now since i'm on a tree kick i went outside as well and picked off another leaf and i'm like oh i found a holy leaf uh, holy in the sense that you can obviously see we've got several little holes in it. 
Now this tree, uh, I believe, is a cherry tree or in a similar family of the cherries. Uh, if not, we're going to say that for now, only because it's also going to be a very similar symptom to it. If you notice, we have holes of varying sizes and shapes. Uh, well, I guess not shapes, I'm sorry, varying sizes. And they're just small little holes. Now, I point this one out because sometimes when trees are stressed, they do silly things. So while these are holes, this actually can be a sign of stress. And again, like I've said, we have had a dry period going on right now. So because it's been dry, uh, it is actually likely that since it's been dry, the tree was stressed a little bit. And that's actually what created those holes. So we don't have to necessarily worry a lot yet because, again, like I said, the tree may just be, you know, stressed from the dryness, and that's all that it is. So we don't have to get real concerned or uptight about it. And that's where we also know our trees. By knowing, again, that this is, you know, most likely a, you know, species of cherry or in that kind of general family area where we know that it is common that they can have silly stress symptoms, we know that this can happen. And then we know, okay, well then we may not have to spray anything because since we know that that is common to it, we also know that, oh, gee, probably don't need to treat it or nothing because again, uh, it is a minor disease, minor problem, not gonna cause anything severe going on in the future as well. So that's kind of one of the great things about, again, knowing your plant, knowing what's going on and knowing what to deal with it. So while we're kind of on that vein of trees, I want to move down one. Now, you might see some holiness on your roses right now. And what's normally the culprit for that? If I were to pause, people are going to say Japanese beetles. Well, then I'm going to ask you, have you seen a Japanese beetle yet? And when we think about that, the answer is no. Japanese beetles usually don't emerge until just the end of May. And I personally haven't seen one yet. I'm not saying they haven't come out yet. Uh, but yeah, you know, there, there are some Japanese beetles that could be out. But if you have extreme holes, whoop, sorry, that time it's flashing on my screen wrong. Um, if you have extreme holes, uh, like this has in this photo here, I apologize. I don't know why. Every other, oh, that's why my screen darkened. I apologize. If you see holes like this, and if you see on some of the lower half here, it looks like it's kind of, I'm going to call it a window painting effect, where it's not the whole leaf. Uh, you have what you call a rose slug sawfly problem here. And it's actually this little bitty insect. Sorry, it's backwards for me. That's the little bitty insect. Now you may say, okay, well, I'll spray the tree and I'll take care of it, or spray the rose and I'll take care of it. Knowing the biology of your insect helps. If I'm trying to do something on a contact, and let's say I, for example, contact, you know, just to make it real clear to you, say, oh no, I have dirt on the bottom of my hand. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take a sanitizing wipe and wipe the top of my hand. And I got the dirt off, right? Because that's where I'm applying it, is I'm applying it to the top, right? Well, no, obviously I said the dirt's here. Well, that's what you have to think about if I was going to use a contact insecticide on this problem. If I only contact the top of the leaf, and if this insect is so small and it's on the bottom of the leaf, I have to make sure I get a treatment up on the underside of the leaf or I have to get a treatment that's called systemic that would be uptaken by the roots in order to basically care for this problem because otherwise I'm not getting to the root of the problem. I'm only getting to the insects, you know, to the top of the leaf and the only thing that is going to assist with is basically helping for when Japanese beetles do come out, you know, when they are there. So we're, again, really not hitting, again, the point of the reason of why we're treating. And there's a lot of things, you know, like horticultural oils and sex oil soaps, neem. There's a lot of things that you can apply, as well as carbaryl, the common, or bifenthrin, or the common other types of insecticides. There's a lot of options out there to hit this poor little, you know, rose slug saw fly. I will point out again, they can do some pretty disastrous damage if you're not careful. They really can make your uh, leaves look very lacy. Again, like I said, it's kind of a window painting because 
think of it like, you know, leaves are basically kind of like, you know, two slices of bread with, you know, a sandwich, the meatiness in the middle. Well, the problem is, is the fact that, again, they're eating on the underside of the leaf. They are small and immature enough. They can only eat the underside of the leaf. So we're just taking that part away and they're eating the meaty, the meatiness out as well. So we just have the top epidermis left and that's it. So that's why it kind of looks stained glass or window painting. When you hold it up to the light, you can see through it. Now you may say, but I, I, I don't have that on mine. Well, keep in mind, if that's all that's left and there's a good enough wind and when that piece dries out, it becomes like paper. The paper can break out and it will become a hole then. So keep that in mind. You know, if you think you might have this as a symptom, turn your leaves over and inspect them. And again, these are really small, tiny little insects, you know, uh, like if you sharpen a pencil, the amount of lead showing is sometimes as long as they are, they're real small. And of course they're green. So it's really hard to see them against the green leaves. Uh, the only hope is, is that usually they seem to ride along the leaf veins. So I always look along the leaf veins first. If I'm going to look, then I look, you know, off more in the open areas if I'm looking for one. But that's where they tend to hang out. As they do get more mature, they can actually eat through the entire leaf at once. But again, they start out where they're so immature, they can only eat this bottom layer and then, you know, they'll eat the nice gushy stuff inside. But they can only chew through the bottom layer. But again, that gives them protection. If an insect is feeding uh, up here on the top, if they're feeding up here on top, all the predators see them. But if they're feeding down here below, predators don't see them. So they're actually safer on there. So that's why, you know, they can be a problem and why we need to make sure we treat them differently. Because again, they can get to be an issue over time. Now, I've never seen that a rose slug sawfly, and rose slug sawfly is what they're called, I've never seen one get so disastrous that I thought it would actually kill a rose. Again, I have had roses, and I've had roses that get fully defoliated by rose slug sawfly, and they came back. Now, then they got hit by Japanese beetles after that, but they still kind of came back the next year after that, so... Uh, some of our plants are a lot more, you know, able to take stress than what we realize. And I would recommend that if you see only minor damage, you like maybe only like five or 10% of the leaves damage, you may be able to leave it alone. They're just about done because they're usually kind of May before the Japanese beetles come out. Well, obviously we're getting into June. So that's what I'm saying. They're just about done now. Uh, but again, it's something to kind of watch out for and be aware of in the landscape that is a problem may require treatment, but at the same token, it may be too late, they may be okay now, and you may not need to worry about them as much. Um, I do want to do another quick reminder again, like I said, if you do have any other questions and things like that about, you know, problems that you are seeing in your, in your yard and garden, I apologize. Uh, if you do see any that you have questions about, feel free to message me. Now, I will point out, and unfortunately, I didn't have a great photo of this yet. I've gotten a lot of people saying, Oh no, some of my vegetables look, you know, kind of peaked right now, especially when you're talking like squash, cucumbers, zucchini, melons, all of those. Oh no, they look kind of, you know, blah. There's like tan sections and especially around the margins of the leaf, it's tan or, you know, may go in some. Well, people are like, but, but I, I, I waited to plant them. I didn't plant them, you know, until after Mother's Day. Well, you remember what happened about a week or two ago? We got a cool spell, and the nights went into the 40s. So a little bit about plants. Some plants don't like to go under 50 degrees. So we had nights in the 40s, or somebody told me once when I actually questioned them, oh, well, I did have a night that it got 39 degrees, and I'm like, okay, I don't know how you got 39 exactly, but that's okay, whatever. Bottom line, we do have some cool weather damage showing up because people were like, well, it's a frost damage. I'm like, no, it wasn't to say frost damage, but just getting too cool, some of those plants are going to be upset. Now, you know, the, the question then becomes, well, is there a concern? Not necessarily. You know, you may have those leaves damaged, but your plants are young. Your plants should be growing. And if they actually start growing, there should be no problem. Because if your plants are, you know, old enough to kind of get up and get growing, 
then they should overcome that very quickly, hopefully. You know, it, it depends. If every leaf is damaged and large portions of it are damaged, then maybe it's not going to do so well right now. Watch it and just basically see what happens. See if you do get, you know, regrowth or not, or basically new growth coming on. If you do get new growth, then good, you're fine. You know, just let them keep going. For things like tomatoes, you may see purpling leaves or, again, the same kind of discoloration uh, or even like a purple-yellow color on the leaves. Again, you know, watch them. They may be stunted by that because I know I put mine out right before that cold snap and I was not very happy, but I also knew that if I didn't get mine in the ground, I was going to have more severe consequences of them dying because I wasn't watering them well. Uh, and I couldn't have them inside because my cat would have destroyed them. So I chose what I thought was the lesser of evils and went ahead and put mine outside. And mine went through that cold snap. I have some leaves that look a little peaked, but for the most part, mine look pretty good. So you may have some plants that are going to fare that well and weather this well and, you know, not be affected at all by it. And I don't think that I see this problem coming up again, fortunately. You know, hopefully we don't, now that we're in June, hopefully we don't have any more nights in the 40s. You know, nights in the 50s might be one thing. And again, that can stunt them. But it hopefully won't cause any, you know, uh, marginal damage to your leaves anymore. So do be aware of that and concerned about that. Now, at the end of the season last year, I know I talked about the annoyance of, oh yeah, you may have... Your zucchini plants all of a sudden wilt and die, and that squash bugs usually get the blame. Well, but then I also pointed out, but the problem is usually this, you know, moth right here. So this is called a squash vine borer, and this is the moth. And I told you last year, this is very diagnostic. So when we look at this moth, it has black wings and a red abdomen, uh, or, you know, red rear end when you look at it over here. Very red with those dots coming down it. These moths will start flying this month, June and July, is when these moths start to fly. Be out in your gardens. Be looking for these moths. If you see these moths, then you know you may need to treat your zucchini plants or your other plants because, again, these are going to lay the eggs. And if you look at a zucchini leaf and how it kind of cups up, they usually lay the leaf, or I'm sorry, they usually lay the eggs up here in the cup you know, maybe down low, but, you know, up here in the top of the cup of the leaf so that the larvae slide down to the heart of the zucchini plant, and then that's when they basically bore in there uh, and hollow out the stem later in the year. So that's why they might collapse in September, August and September, is because, first of all, the egg has to mature. Second of all, it has to slide down and bore into the stalk. Third of all, it starts out very small, so it's not going to cause that much interference at first. Give it time, and yes, it's going to get bigger and bigger, and it's going to cause more and more tunnels, and as it, you know, tunnels in that stem more, that's when it's going to get to a point the plant says, basically, I give up, I can't handle this anymore, and it basically wilts and dies because it cannot get the resources it needs to the leaves of the plant, and that's when you get the whole plant failure, collapse, die. It can also cause certain vine, vining ones to die too, like, you know, sometimes your squash plants. So be aware, again, watch for that moth. You know, again, it is a major concern. I'll show you the picture again one more time. Um, but this is exactly, like I said, what the moth looks like. Again, it is, sorry, I'm getting glare occasionally. It is primarily, you know, kind of red and black. And again, you will see it sitting on top of the zucchini leaves anywhere this next, or the, these next two months. Because usually I think of it end of May, early June. So again, be aware. It may be more mid-June this year because we kind of start off so slow and so cool. Uh, but again, it can be any time coming up now soon. So if you want to be able to have your, you know, complete proliferation, I'll say, of zucchinis that you uh, are going to try to share like I'll say crazy, then yeah, you know, you need to make sure that you are getting out there and watching for that moth so that that way you know if you need to treat. Now, granted, I'm telling you, watch for the moth. To know if you need to treat. All right, I'm telling you that, but if you had plant failure last year, and even if you disposed of the old plants, like I told you, in the garbage, not in a compost heap, unless you know it got to a high enough temp that it killed the larva, 
if you dispose of the garbage, you might say, well, am I safe? Do I really need to go through, you know, these steps of, you know, watching for it and, oh, I never saw it, so now I'm safe. That's going to be a call for you to be, uh, do you want to be safe or sorry? So you may say, okay, well, since I don't see it, I'm not going to treat, and you can take a risk. But you are taking a risk because what if the timing was just not quite right? You know, you're not out in that garden all day, and I'm not going to say night because you may not see them flying at night uh, regardless, but you're not out there all day. You may not have caught it, and it doesn't necessarily take that long for it to visit your plant, lay some eggs, and wander off. So keep that in mind that I was lucky enough one year that I did see them off and was able to make, you know, treatments for the plant. And the key is, is if you catch the moth early enough, you can stick with probably more insecticides that you do, like the contact ones that we talked earlier about. You know, we can probably stick to more of a contact insecticide. But if you don't catch it in those early stages, you're going to have to look more of a systemic insecticide, one that, again, you pour around basically the plant, uh, or maybe spray on that the plant absorbs, but we have to make sure we get it in the plant because again, once that larva bores into the stem of the plant, you're not going to be able to get to it anymore. So you need to make sure you're getting the insecticide where it belongs if you need it. And another option you could have too is if you don't think you see it and you want to, you know, be, you know, maybe a little side of the caution, maybe just treat part of your plants so that that way you might have some that'll live and survive, and others you're just saying, yeah, never mind. So that is an option for you. But again, something to be aware of, you know, be cognizant of that, and that that is going to be a problem in the fall for you instead of maybe the squash vine bugs. Uh, so the other thing I want to also point out is the fact that people always get so excited about, oh, I see blooms, I see blooms. And the problem is, is they think, oh, I'm going to have all this early, fresh, you know, produce coming on soon. Well, we talked about this again, you know, of, you know, you need to make sure that when you are seeing your squash flowers, are we sexing the flowers? Are we making sure to see, are they male versus a female flower? So again, we need to be watching for that in our gardens and in our landscapes. So here is a pictured example of a female flower. Oops, sorry. Uh, and we see behind this female flower, we see basically a stump. Whereas when we look at the male flower, it's just a straight stalk. So again, that's how we kind of look and say, okay, well, I see a straight stalk versus I see like a little mini cucumber behind the flower. So we need to be aware of that in our gardens. Because uh, I know I was out looking at some different gardens lately, and we were pulling flowers off, and we were pulling flowers off just because the plant was itty-bitty, yet producing a million flowers right now, which were not necessary, so we decided just to pluck the flowers off. Every flower we plucked was a male, because again, it had the very, you know, slender, skinny stem, and it didn't look like a mini zucchini, or a mini cucumber, or a mini pumpkin. So since it didn't look like that mininess behind it, we knew every flower was a male flower. So keep that in mind that, you know, yeah, you can get male or female flowers, and it can eventually be male and female flowers. But weather sometimes dictates whether you get more male or more female flowers. So keep that in mind that, you know, oh, now it's getting hot. You know, now because it's getting so hot, it may also naturally put up more male flowers. And in the cooler times, it may put on more female flowers. But don't worry, eventually you should hopefully get both at the same token. Just make sure, like for example, if you were trying to stop that, you know, evil squash vine borer from coming on. So if you were trying to try to make sure this guy isn't causing a problem, so I'm going to put covers over my veggies. Well, realize you're going to keep out the bad guys and the good guys. You need your pollinators in there. So we need to make sure that you are allowing your pollinators to get to your garden. So we don't want your plants covered 100% of the time. You know, a quick little vein of thought I want to also go on is pollinators. And keep in mind, you know, I had this conversation this week as well with someone that they were like, oh, I've got these bees coming out of the ground and you know how to kill them because, you know, they're driving me nuts. They're causing problems. And I'm like, what problem are they causing? Well, they're right next to a garden bed. Well, it turned out later he admitted that it wasn't next to, it was going to be under a garden bed. He's like, well, yeah, he's like, you know, I, I want to get rid of them. And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, because they're a problem. And I said, do you realize, I said, those are native pollinators. I said, do you realize 
honeybees are actually foreign. Most honeybees are not truly native pollinators to Indiana. We have other bees, like certain bumblebees, and we have a bunch of Indiana native bees that are actually native to Indiana rather than our honeybees. And they may be ground dwelling, or if you have like canes left up, like from your showy sedums, I'm sorry, or certain grasses that are empty hollow canes, that's where they actually lay their eggs, and that's where they actually might overwinter. Those are actually our native ones that actually will do a lot of good in our landscapes as well if they're allowed to persist. So keep that in mind when you're out gardening that, you know, I, I've had to keep training my kids. No, the carpenter bee is not going to sting you. Uh, at the extension office, you know, I had to laugh. Uh, there was a guide of, you know, we who sting or something like that. And it was all about different pollinators, including yellow jackets, and the level to which they may or may not sting you. And, of course, the yellow jackets was high. Um, I had to laugh at that. But then they had other ones like carpenter bees, and it was low. And I'm like, look, see here, you know, even we admit the chance of you getting stung by actually carpenter bees or certain other native bees is very low or non-existent because they're also what's called hoverflies that especially come out in the air. Okay, well, it looks like a bee, but again, it's called a hoverfly, so it's actually a fly, so you're not going to get stung because it's more like a fly than a bee. So keep that in mind. I also want to point out as we're talking about that because another bee or wasp-like thing that you're probably going to start seeing coming out if you haven't already is our cicada killer wasps. So cicadas, especially our annual cicadas. So keep in mind, we have annual cicadas this year and we have periodical cicadas. Annual cicadas are more green. Periodical cicadas are more of a chance to be like red and black. So our periodical cicadas are coming out. Annual, or I'm sorry, our annual cicadas are coming out. Periodical cicadas, I think the emergences are starting to come out. Keep in mind, unless you are in an area that has been forested for years and years and years and years and years and years, and years at a time, you know, you may or may not see a lot of the influx of these cicadas, but a cicada killer looks like a yellow jacket, basically, we would say, on steroids. It's huge. It's like two inches long. But again, even at that, even though it's such a large wasp, if you look probably on that, you know, we sting publication that I had, even if we look at that, I guarantee you the cicada killer wasp sting rating is going to be low. They're solitary, number one, meaning they don't live in groups. You know, yellow jackets make a huge nest. Carpenter bees and cicada killers make single nests. So it means they're not congregate. They're more of, you know, the ones of like people who are like, yeah, nope, I'm good being alone. You know, I, I, I'm good with some me time. Let me have some me time. That's how they kind of roll, I'll say. They're not ones that have to be, you know, in a group, live in a colony. So because of that, that's why they're a lower sting, probably potential number one, because you don't get a lot of them together. But secondly, you know, they're just not aggressive. They may get aggressive around their nest or around their home. So if a cicada killer especially has like laid eggs in the ground, then yeah, she may be aggressive because she has babies. But before she has babies, you know, she's got nothing to protect. She's got nothing against you. She just wants to go find cicadas and paralyze them to feed her young. So we don't have to worry about certain wasps and certain insects. Uh, carpenter bees as well. It's like we have one spot of untreated wood at our house. And every year there's always one or two carpenter bees in that area, if not sometimes more. And that's why I keep trying to train my kids. Look, I'm sorry that you have to walk, you know, past this area in order to go to take care of our chickens. I said, but I said, as long as you are not aggressive at the carpenter bees. I said, just walk, you know, not run. Just walk straight past them. I said, they may buzz your head, I said, but they're going to then completely ignore you and fly away once you are away from this one wooden area. You know, once you get past that, they're done with you. So it probably tells me as well if I would just treat that wood, which is an option. If you treat the wood, they are less likely to be there. If I would just treat the wood, you know, paint it and, you know, do something else to it, the carpenter bees would probably go away. But again, I don't care because I know 
I just ignore them and walk on. That's all I do. I ignore them and walk on, and we live happily together. It's just the kids that have a problem with them. So I just get them to get over it after a while, and they do. So we need to learn to live with some of our native bees and wasps because they really do good things for us at different times of the year. So keep that in mind. You know, they are beneficial to our landscape. They are beneficial to our environment. So sometimes we may have to put up with their nonsense, um, but then we can, you know, move on with all say our lives beyond that. Um, I'll know the same other quick comment if, for those of you who are on live. Again, if you do have any questions, you know, I can definitely answer anything that you have, you know, coming up in your gardens and landscapes. So I'm pulling up the next thing that I want you to be aware of is that this is a time of year as well that different plants are starting to get up and grow. So we may have things like your poison ivy coming up. Or, you know, I'm going to show you this broadly first. You know, this plant, if we look at it, and I, I wanted to bring in a sample, but you'll know why I did in a second. It kind of looks like a Queen Anne Lace, Queen's Anne's Lace plant when we look at it. And we can even see, oh, yeah, it has some pretty flowers starting on it already. Maybe it's Queen Anne's Lace. Well, the answer is no. This is not Queen Anne's Lace. Because when we go to look at the stem of this plant, what you see here is you notice that it's a darkening and a reddening of the stem. So this is what they call poison hemlock. So now as soon as you say that, oh no, it's very dangerous. Yes and no. It is dangerous, but on the level of like poison ivy, poison hemlock, I would rather run into poison hemlock than poison ivy um, because it is a skin irritant, um, but it is kind of a little lesser for most people. It is lesser than uh, the poison ivy irritant you may have. And believe me, I know about poison ivy irritants because I'm the lucky one that knows how to get poison ivy in the winter time, which is another good warning. You know, it's campfire season. If you are buying firewood, make sure there's no vines or pads looking from vines that were on it. Because again, if you burn that and it had poison ivy on it, then you can get poison ivy all over your face. Um, and some people can get it so severe they actually get it in their lungs. So do be very cautious that you don't burn firewood and open campfires that has had poison ivy on it. I was fortunate we threw it into a wood burner. So, you know, during the middle of the winter, so therefore we weren't outside. So we didn't have that concern. And I just instead, you know, apparently touched, touched the wood, touched my face and got poison out of my face. So keep in mind that that is a danger and a concern. So getting back to the poison hemlock. So if you see that, that's something that you probably want to get, like maybe some chemical resistant gloves just to be safe, you know, get some gloves and definitely pull it out or get some, you know, sort of an herbicide maybe to kill it and kill it so that you don't have a problem. It is a biennial. So that means that it stays leafy green the first year, the second year, you know, it bolts and flowers. So it will bolt and flower in its second year, which means it's been there and you didn't know it for a year. Um, but it will bolt and flower on its second year and spread. So ideally, you'd want to get it. You know, like I said, on that one, I saw the flowers now. So that means you'd want to treat it ASAP so that you don't have more seeds coming into the area uh, for future years coming on. So it's a great thing to start looking out for, you know, okay, do I have poisonous plants in the area or not? Now, I will point out that, you know, sometimes, you know, people may think, oh, I've got this and it's such a horrible poisonous plant. And sometimes we figure out, no, because like, for example, you may hear about poison sumac and people will say, oh, I've got poison sumac. And I'm like, are the stems fuzzy? Yeah, not poison sumac. You know, poison sumac usually is a more naked stem. We have what we call staghorn sumac here or other plants that are sumacs that are ornamentals. So keep in mind that it's a specific plant that is poison sumac, and that one, you know, is pretty nasty, but it's also not that typically in Indiana. It is something that you may more see, like, uh, I believe it's in Michigan or in other states. So it's something to be aware of, but again, it's not necessarily in this area. So uh, be aware of that. Poison ivy, poison oak. Those two look basically almost exactly the similar and probably misidentified as each other all the time, but it's basically the same plant. Uh, you may have heard the old adage, leaves a three, let it be. And that's precautionary because poison ivy, yes, has the three leaves, but so does box elder, so do raspberries. What do we do then? 
Well, another thing to denote, poison ivy does not have thorns. So if you're trying to decide, is this poison ivy versus wild raspberries, if it has thorns, it's poison, or I'm sorry, if it's got thorns, it's raspberries. So yeah, you can go ahead and touch it because it's thorny, it's just a thorny raspberry. It's not poison, or it's not poison ivy. Now between our native box elder tree and poison ivy, that gets again very difficult to tell the difference again because they both have leaves of three and they're both um, a naked or basically a smooth stem. So you may say, well, what do we do now? Well, an easy way then to start figuring out which is which, and I can even use this lovely beech leaf here to kind of help me a little bit with it that I had out earlier. If you notice the arrangement of leaves on this stem, we have a leaf, well, this one doesn't do it as well, but a leaf, then we have a leaf, and this leaf is down here, just got ripped off. So the leaves are not across from each other. You will have others, since this leaf is about to fall off, I'll mimic it better. You will have other plants whose leaves are across from each other, like this now mimics more. They're dead across from each other, and usually they're staggered up the stem like this. That's called an opposite leaf arrangement. Now, what I like to tell people is the fact that if the leaves are shaking hands across a stem, so if the leaves are opposite leaf arrangement, if they're shaking hands, you can shake its hand because a box elder tree has an opposite leaf arrangement. So again, leaves across from each other, across from each other on the stem. Whereas poison ivy has an alternate leaf arrangement. So again, if its leaves are not across from it, if its leaves aren't going to touch each other, don't touch it. You know, there can be other plants as well that have this whole leaves of three. But that's where, again, it's one other way to tell, you know, another safety factor or not. So leaves of three, let it be. If it's got thorns, though, it's just a raspberry. Also, if it's an opposite arrangement, oh, no, it's our native box elder tree, uh, which, curiously enough, is actually more in the maple family than anything. Um, but anyways, it's, leaf, uh, it's opposite, so we can shake its hands because the leaves are shaking hands. So some quick tips to hopefully keep you safe as you guys are moving back out into the gardens this year again. Do watch out. And when I mean leaves of three, uh, the leaves are going to be, I can actually pluck all these leaves off now and show you, the leaves are going to be staggered. So it's going to be like two leaves with one sticking up here. Then they attach to the stem. So it'll look very similar to this. So, you know, one top leaf, two bottom leaves, and then that attaches to the stem. Um, something, of course, that I would not touch except for with uh, nitrile or some sort of latex gloves because I am not touching poison ivy after my experiences this past winter time. I like that I am one that is very sensitive to it. So again, like I said, uh, we're getting close to the, about said noon hour, but that's what time we started. We're getting close to the one o'clock hour. So as we're getting ready to wrap up, I just want to, you know, do some, some couple quick reminders of things that you may or may not see going on. And the first one is a reminder, you know, hey, odd things pop up in the garden of what's this? Well, again, I talked about that being on this beech tree, and I talked about how I knew it was a beech because of how these, you know, veins come off. That's, you know, my personal trick. And then I remember, oh, this hairy, crazy, you know, kind of rough, you know, thing, maybe it's the flower or the fruit, and that's what it is. This is the fruit of the tree. You know, if we could snap this open, I can't. Um, if we could snap it open, it makes a triangular seed that, you know, releases in the fall. So be vigilant of our trees. You know, go out there, see them, see what they look like and see what's going on with them now. Um, again, I challenge you right now, you know, hey, again, go look for that, you know, tulip tree flower. Go see if you can actually find one in your landscapes. Uh, because again, like I said, it is something that is blooming at, at this time frame now. It is a great, you know, an example of how sometimes our trees can have multiple interests. So again, like I said, whoops, sorry. Whoa, that's coming up. I don't know. Um, but yeah, some dark spot thing. But yeah, look for our nice little tulip tree flowers that, you know, can be appearing on our trees. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing to see that and support it since our it's our native tree or it's an Indiana native tree and the state tree of Indiana. That's what I was trying to say. I will give a precaution that, you know, I, I love that tree and I'd love to see it planted more. We titled this Current Problems. But I'll tell you a future problem of that tree is that it does tend to get a uh, either a scale or an aphid or something later in the fall. 
that if you park your cars under it or you put a bench under it, it might get sticky and turn black. So I love that tree, but don't put it near your driveway or don't, you know, put it in plan to, you know, again, have, you know, nice outdoor furniture around it year round because they could turn sticky and black, unfortunately, later in the season. You know, granted, a little soap and water will take care of it, but most people, that's a major deterrent. But again, plant it in your yard as a nice, you know, you know, specimen tree to go look at and have, like, maybe be your focal point as part of a garden uh, and kind of support the tree that both is a tree and has a flower, which is one of the very few ones. So I challenge you to go out and look out because they're not going to be flowering that much longer, but they're there. Um, and again, realize, again, we talked about oaks and this lovely blister gall. And how not all measly things that look like they're a problem. You know, the, the seed pod, well, that's just interesting and it's normal. This, not normal. It is a disease. It's a fungal disease. But again, we talked about this, just like anthracnose. Not a big deal. The tree's basically got like a little cold or maybe athlete's foot. I don't know, because we get that. And it's just a fungal infection that annoys us. But it's not usually life-threatening, serious problem. So again, like I said, we may see some of these. We may even see other galls developing on the trees. Um, just realize, you know, yeah, a lot of this stuff, yeah, it's annoying. It's a problem, but it's nothing that we need to necessarily deal with. But it's good to, well, let's look at it. Let's see what it is, and let's make sure it's not a problem. Unlike, for example, if you were to take a look at your spruce tree and all of a sudden see that it's turning colors, uh-oh, we better get on that top of that quicker because maybe that is a problem we need to be aware of because they shouldn't turn colors unless it's blue for uh, one that has more of a blue hue or white for one that has a white hue. But again, we need to be watching out for that sort of thing to be happening and occurring so that we know what's abnormal. Um, that also makes me realize that, you know, one other thing to watch out for when we're talking about spruces and evergreens this is not a very common problem, but if you get some of the fancier, I'm going to say varieties, so maybe a grafted white pine or some of the fancier varieties of white pine, I don't see it much on our standard, you know, windbreak, you know, large, huge, you know, uh, breezy in the wind white pines. I don't see it as much on them, but there is what's called like a white pine adelgid, and it is white. So you can see it against the black stem, but the problem is you only see it if you go peeking into the foliage and look at the stems of the plant. So there is this white pine adelgid that is starting to get active and growing. So if you have any sort of a specimen white pine plant, uh, and again, like I said, this cannot or this may be small. It may not be one of those huge trees. You can tell a white pine apart because where like the needles clump together to come off the stem. Where they clump off, if you tear that clump and you count the needles, there'll be five. White pines, W-H-I-T-E, white. So you will actually find, <laughs> fortunately enough that we spell that way in our English language, you'll actually find five needles per cluster on the stem. And that's how, again, you know it's kind of in that white pine-ish family. So again, like I said, watch out for that because we want to make sure that, you know, that doesn't become a severe issue and cause harm to your plant in the long run. And again, can cause some of that stickiness to happen as well that we mentioned. So be out in your gardens, be observant, but enjoy it as well. You know, I'm seeing the basswood seeds come out and I'm enjoying all the smells. I'm enjoying watching that the rhododendrons are, you know, in full bloom, if not starting to fade a little bit right now. But there's a lot to see in our gardens right now. You know, go smell the roses. And while you're smelling the roses, Look for that evil little rose slug sawfly that could be, again, eating holes in your leaves. So we need to watch out for that again and see, you know, how, how rough is it getting on my plant? You know, yeah, it's almost done, but if it's getting too rough, maybe I need to take care of it so that that way it doesn't get too bad. Or maybe I need to watch out for it next year and then maybe apply a little bit of, you know, insecticidal soap or neem to the undersides of the leaves so that that way I take care of it. Because, again, remember we talked about it's kind of a, you know, wimpy little insect in that it's on the underside of the leaf and it can chew up this part and likes the gooey stuff in the middle. Who doesn't like gooey stuff in the middle part of the time? Um, but it can't always eat this top part. So that's where we can see a window pane where we just see through that top part. But again, the window pane, just like, you know, this cherry leaf, the window pane can pop out 
and sometimes come out just like on this cherry. You know, again, it's called like a shotgun effect or uh, where basically this might have been papery that kind of fell out and it just looks like shotgun, shotgun scatter later or that pellet scatter. Um, but yeah, you know, watch out for things like that in the landscape when you get in while you're out observing your plants to see, you know, what is becoming a problem, what has been a problem, or what is interesting that is normal that is going on with my plants. Uh, you know, magnolias bloomed earlier in the year. Soon, magnolias are going to have their seed pods, if they're going to have them, they're going to have seed pods on them. That's a very interesting structure that if you've never seen, you know, Google, you know, or Bing or whatever your, you know, preference of browser is, Safari. Browse what a magnolia seed pod looks like. And it's a very interesting structure uh, that we don't always think about. It looks rather odd because it also is kind of like long hornish. Um, but again, we can be out there and be vigilant to see, you know, what is going on, what, you know, interesting you know, structures or features are developing, uh, especially from all the different seeds or pods that are coming out at this time of the year. So again, be aware of our landscapes and what is going on. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to ask, you know, a question today or comment today and would want to, you know, have, you know, or have something in the future, feel free to follow up either with, you know, Purdue Northwest Gavis Arboretum. You can follow up with them and they can get me a question or you feel free to, you know, shoot me either an email or call me, you know, at the Purdue Porter County Extension office. My email address is just my name, Nikki, spelled N-I-K-K-Y, and then at Purdue, P-U-R-D-U-E dot E-D-U. So Nikki at Purdue dot E-D-U. So you can feel free to follow up with us and we'll definitely assist you with what other problems and things like that that you're seeing going on in the landscape. So again, you know, be watchful, be mindful. A lot of things are putting seed pods on right now that we can see that are interesting uh, with it as well. Uh, especially, I, I encourage you as time goes on this year, if you can find hornbeams or uh, sometimes even elms, especially hornbeam or blue beech are two other native trees. Man, I love the seed pods that they develop, especially the American hornbeam. Um, I was taught to identify it because you know how Americans love, they say baseball. Well, looks like it has a baseball glove with a ball in the middle of it. So it's really, really awesome of a seed pod. So there's some really interesting and different ones. So with that, we're a little bit before the one o'clock hour, but we start a little bit early too. Uh, again, my name is Nikki Wachowski. I'm with the Porter County Extension Office, and I want to thank as well uh, Tall Tree and Gavis Arboretum for allowing us to come out today. And please feel free to send us on any questions that you may have in the future. Uh, probably see you again later. Thank you all.